Hello, friends. Uh, welcome to Be Waste Wise. Today, we have uh, Adam Reed and Michael Webster with us today. And uh, Adam Reed is going to be moderating a few panels for us this year. And this is the first in the series that he is going to be moderating for us. And uh, he currently is the Director of External Affairs at Suez Recycling. So I'm just going to hand this over to him. And uh, he'll introduce himself. And he'll also introduce the context of the panel. So over to you, Adam. Well, well, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending where on the world you are today. It's uh, an absolute pleasure to be with you. Uh, I enjoyed uh, a couple of these sessions last year with the Be Waste Wise program. Uh, I found them both uh, informative and, and educational, but more importantly, genuinely uh, humorous and, and personable. And I think that's quite important when we're giving up our lunch or breakfast or dinner, depending on where you are in the world, to, uh, to listen to Mike and I today talk about all things developing economy and sustainable waste management. So as you've heard, I'm the External Affairs, Affairs Director at Suez here in the UK. Um, for my sins, I spent five years working for ERM on international donor-funded waste management and sustainability projects back in the early 2000s. Um, and for the last 15 years, I've done a lot of international work, albeit I've become less and less focused on developing economies and transition economies and more and more focused on uh, large economies uh, like, uh, like Australia uh, and now back to the UK. So uh, I'm going to reflect on some of my time spent in the field and Mike will bring us up to date with all the big issues in the marketplace because he's, uh, he's, he's not often in the UK these days, I believe. Okay. So um, yeah. before, I, before I bring Mike onto the, onto the call, uh, I'd just like to say, having spent much of the noughties traveling the world, on uh, UN funded, World Bank funded, uh, DFID funded and other donor agency funded waste management projects. I, I was involved in dump site upgrades. I was involved in curbside recycling rollout. That sounds quite adventurous. Uh, composting plant development. Um, we've done upskilling workforces. We franchise collection systems. Uh, I've probably missed a few important ones. Oh, and I've, I've written more regional waste strategies than I care to remember, from uh, the Urals in Russia uh, to Costa Rica uh, and, and as far afield as uh, places in Australia and, and Timbuktu. Um, go and look it up, those of you that don't know where it is. Mali's a great place to work, but um, an interesting place to work, and I might reflect on that in a moment. So I've had a lot of experience. Um, I've been out of that game for a little while now, focusing more on the UK, but I reflect fondly on my time overseas. I, I thoroughly enjoyed working with people that wanted to change their environment, and, and, in, and my role was to help empower them to do a great job. But... I was always worried about the legacy of those projects. I think I used to get jettisoned in for two weeks, three weeks, a month or whatever, and maybe over the course of a year, I'd visit eight or nine times. But I always worried about what happened when those projects stopped, what happened when the Western influence, the Western money, the Western technologies, the Western know-how ceased to be funded. And I'm keen to hear from Mike and reflect on his last five or six years about how working with communities from the bottom up is perhaps a more sustainable and long-term solution. So that's my introduction. It's a, it's a pleasure to have so many of you join us. Uh, I hope you get something from it. Most importantly, you can drop an email or sorry, a, a group chat comment in. If you've got a question, fire it in and I'll make sure that Mike or I answer it. Uh, this is very much your session as much as it is Mike and I. So that's enough from me. Uh, this is Mike Webster, Chief Executive uh, with Waste Aid. Mike, do you want to give us a little introduction to you, the business and, and what you've been up to recently? Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, first of all, it's great to be able to have a conversation with someone with such a, a depth of uh, background within the sector. Uh, I'm not sure I can uh, match it. Well, not yet, So, but I'm, I'm doing my best to get there. Um, so Waste Aid is set up at the end of 2014, uh, essentially to fit in with that gap. There was no uh, kind of not-for-profit charity that was focusing purely on working uh, in those parts of the world without formal waste collection. Uh, about the same time that we were created, um, a publication, Global Waste Management Outlook, was produced uh, by the UNEP, the UN Environment Programme, and a few key quite significant stats fell out of that. Two billion people don't essentially have their waste collected and three billion don't have it controlled. But it might be picked up, it might be a donkey in a car, they take it to the end of the street, but it's essentially dumped in an uncontrolled dump site. So that's a lot of people and a lot of rubbish 
with a lot of impact. Um, what uh, our specific focus is on working in those parts of the world yeah, that don't have that formal waste collection. That could be a, um, a slum area, an informal settlement within a town or a city. It could be an entire village or town somewhere that's just on the kind of edge of a municipal area. So it doesn't, you know, it really kind of falls off the, uh, the political agenda and doesn't have, a, have its garbage collected. But it's trying to work in those parts of the world and work in a sustained way. So how do we do it? First of all, well, we have a framework for action. First of all, it's understanding what's in the garbage because you can only manage stuff that, when you know what's in there. Secondly, it's finding a good local partner who wants to do this. OK, now, because waste is, uh, in my view, quite a neglected area in many parts of the world and also in the global development scene, there are not a lot of organisations with waste knowledge. So we take, take, we will work with anyone who's interested. It could be a women's group, it could be a youth employment group, it could be a church, it could be anything. Um, so that's the second stage. The third stage is working out what you can do with those materials that are being uh, discarded. So it's understanding obviously what's in the waste stream, but understanding how can we create value chains from those materials. So understanding, okay, there tends to be a lot of organic waste. What can we do to valorize that? There tends to be typically plastic. Plastics is high on the agenda at the moment. What can we do to valorize that? Um, either within a community or segregating and selling on to people who are interested. Then, of course, there's working, <clears throat> excuse me, with the um, the local government, understanding, um, how, you know, what can we do? Uh, they might not be delivering a service, but it's very important to have a good relationship with them. OK, and then finally, it's sitting there and working with our partners to say, OK, right, we know what's in the waste. We know what the end markets are. We know who's doing what. What do you want to do? Because everything has to be led by them. And that really, we think, is the key to sustainability and keeping things going. So getting that kind of local buy-in. So um, that's what we, uh, that's who we are and that's our approach. Where are we working at the moment? We have a plastics recycling um, facility in the Gambia. My colleague Zoe is doing a fantastic job uh, managing that. Um, so what is that is doing is looking at film plastic, low value LDPE. Uh, it was identified as a particularly a problem waste. There was no particular end market for it. No one wanted to do it. And using simple technologies to turn it into building materials. Um, there, we've just started working in um, Kenya, in East Africa, again, in a similar community with no formal waste collection, uh, taking a slightly broader approach, looking at you know, what are the materials that can be either valorized within the community or sold on. It's only been going for a couple of months, so we're still in that kind of process of identifying what there is and what can be sold on. Um, and then, um, coming up, we're going to have a much bigger um, plastics and marine plastics recycling plant in uh, Cameroon um, from hopefully the end of this year. Um, but there's going to be a big national appeal for that. So anyone who wants to get involved there, thought I'd quickly get that in there. Um, <laughs> so Mike, go on. But let me let me interrupt because you know this is fantastic. Yeah, sure. But you know, tell me about why did where did you get involved? Where, you know, you when I was working internationally all those years ago. You know, you weren't in my space. You know, you were back in the UK yeah. doing what you were doing. Where, where did the passion for this international space come from? Because you've kind of, you know, you've bre you've you've kind of yeah. you've created a business, a charity. You've you've made it happen in a very relatively short period of time. What's driving you, and, and, and what did you do beforehand? What, what, what you know, what's yeah. your background? So my background is uh, I had one foot in community development. So I'd be going overseas, working with uh, small scale projects. I did a uh, working for was running a school in uh, Nigeria, end of the noughties, uh, 98 to 2000. Come back to the UK, work, wanted to work in the environment, and waste was there. Okay, that was the job. So did it for a few years, um, involved with local authority rollouts. You know that time where we're uh, expanding the recycling fast, but then thought, okay, what can we do in low-income countries to kind of share those skills? I spent a year running a uh, um, Composting scheme, community composting scheme in the Southwest Pacific and thought, OK, I want to bring those skills back. There's a clear need for this. There's a lot of people living in a lot of urban areas. There's a lot of waste around. I mean, the thing about waste is you can see it, you know, uh, go out on the street. Um, if, if the drains are full of plastic and rubbish, if the uh, if there's piles of burning garbage everywhere. I thought, OK. Um, came, brought it back to the UK and thought, oh, right, who can I work for to do that? And it slowly dawned that there is no one actually doing this as an organisation. Now, there were you know, some fantastic efforts from consultants and people working in that area, but there's no one actually doing this just as their kind of almost core business. And taking learning from that community development approach, 
the health people, the education people, they've been doing this for decades. You know, in the 1970s, the health people were thinking, well, we'll build a hospital. Um, they, you know, you spend millions building a hospital, um, but then you realize that no one's got the funds to keep it going. No one can actually get to the hospital. There's no money to buy the drugs or you know, even maintain the expensive equipment. So actually, if you want to get people better, okay, why don't we take a quite simple approach where we, you know, for instance, have people, community nurses within a village who uh, you know, know how to uh, prescribe some basic antibiotics, anti-malarials, do the first aid. Now that will get most people better than actually spending a lot of money on a single big hospital, for instance. So I was thinking, okay, why can't we take that approach with waste? And um, so meanwhile, there are lots of people that are beginning to do bits and pieces, but you know, myself and it wasn't just me, there are lots of other uh, individuals, you know, people who are on our boards, um, Zoe, who I've just mentioned, you know, essentially we came together to say, OK, what can we do to bring that kind of community development grassroots approach? Now, you know, maybe it's uh, just luck, maybe it's just um, kind of synchronicity, if you like. But um, all of a sudden we've been inundated, essentially. I mean, every day I have an email from someone going, hi, look, I'm living in a town. We're drowning in garbage. What can we do? OK. And so um, there's a huge amount of interest. There's a huge amount of grassroots interest, you know. As someone told me here once, um, no politicians ever get voted in because of waste, but a lot of them might get voted out, but none of them get voted in. So it's something that was of interest to people, but, you know, a garbage collection isn't as impressive as, uh, I don't know, a motorway or an airport. So perhaps it was just not on as many people's, on as many politicians' agendas. Um, also, yeah, we thought that there was just a need for an organisation that kept banging on about this, kept thinking, all right, how do we make this stuff going you know it's the sustainability that really keeps going everyone gets excited about our recycling technologies wow you can turn this into this that's not the point it's the cost recovery how do you keep the money going round and round and round okay and that is essentially the tricky bit okay and i'm not pretending i have all the solutions you know we're all on a learning curve um but you know th that is what we're thinking about right how can we make someone picking up this rubbish, getting it out of harm's way, ideally creating as much value as possible. But how do we make that pay in a place where essentially people can't afford a waste collection, which is essentially why there isn't one there in the first place. How do we get over there? So that's what we, we kind of been thinking about. Well, let me pick up on that. I think you've raised a couple of really interesting points there, Mike, which is you're looking to make sustainability with the economic aspect you know as local as possible here because you're keeping money in the economy and and, and that's driving change but you know my experiences are you know great composting technologies from from german and dutch and danish consultancies back in the day you know big manufacturers dropping them into india bangladesh uh, I've seen them in Pakistan. I've seen them across North Africa. Um, other brands, of course, are available. And and, and what and I, I, you made the point interestingly already, but I, I'm going to reinforce it because I, I want to talk about this a bit more. They worked for all of five minutes yeah. because they weren't of the local environment. They weren't used to working in the heat or in the humidity. Yeah. They weren't used to the the, the composition that was going to come in and and, yeah. and what i found was that within weeks they were being stripped for their assets people were taking the metal they were taking the yeah. screws the nuts the bolts and they mm. were selling them on the open market as raw material now there's your value you know, there's your recycling value eh? absolutely so i think you yeah. know that community up upswell how do we embed something that is going to be about a community and its economy is far more more beneficial in my experience and certainly from yours i would suggest yeah. than some great piece of kit that works for three minutes no absolutely and i mean that is you know that is again one of the reasons hopefully one of the things that we can achieve is get waste and development people talking to each other you know there are projects that probably from a waste point of view look fantastic on paper you know there's a large amount of organic waste there's a big demand for uh, you know agricultural nu nutrients hey let's build a big composting plant there's a great technology from Germany that turns large amounts of you know, organic waste into compost very quickly and efficiently. Let's use that, bang, bang, bang. Great, from a waste point of view, that stacks up, okay? Then the development people go, okay, well, you know, how do we pay for the collection of the organic material and bring it to the, <coughs> uh, excuse me, the, uh, the, the composting site, okay? Do the farmers who are gonna put it on their land, do they know about this stuff? Do they want to pay for it? When the uh, sprocket, the widget goes wrong that does all the magic within the composting plant, who's going to pay for that new one where's it going to come from are we going to have to import it using hard currency from you know frankfurt is it going to cost a fortune okay so 
it's getting development people and waste people starting to talk to each other more and more and more. There's also, on the other hand, getting, <coughs> excuse me, waste people talking to development people. Um, you know, I, I remember seeing a project which was a paper recycling uh, project in the Gambia um, where it was trying to turn um, paper briquettes into fuel. Great, there's a need for fuel, but actually there's no paper in the waste stream. You know, <laughs> and I mean, the way that they kept struggling on was by actually sending a truck down again when they could scrape the money together to the Ministry of Finance to get a load of old tax returns. Because literally that was the only old, that was the only bulk paper in the country. Now, there was clearly an assumption there that, well, actually, again, this, this uh, organization was German. Sorry, I'm not going to go specifically the Germans, but they thought, well, there's lots of paper in the German waste stream. There must therefore be the West African waste stream. So, yeah, it's getting waste and development people to talk to each other. Again, you know, waste aid, the name isn't very original. You know, Water Aid uh, was set up in the early 80s. You know, they were a group of water engineers saying, hold on, we've got these skills and so forth. What can we do to share it so everyone's got a tap and a, a toilet, basically? And so all of we, we have done, essentially 35 years later, said, you know, OK, we're a group of voice managers. What can we do to get this stuff going? Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, that, it's, that, it's that idea of, um, but the, the challenges are different, but the opportunities are as well. So, for instance, thinking about you know, a lot of the technologies that we use, for instance, in the UK, are because labour is expensive. OK, so your MRF, which has got, you know, whizzy lines for everything and um, can sort everything within the nth degree is essentially designed to sort as much material as well as possible, probably for the least number of people doing it. You know, that's essentially because labour is expensive. So um, in places where labour is cheaper, um, what can we do to, you know, lab more labour intensive approaches are um, you know, probably not going to be a problem. So. Um, yeah, uh, you know, it, it, there are there are opportunities, and also um, we could we can crack on and set up, you know, recycling facilities, community recycling facilities, and so forth, in a much simpler and easier way than you know we can in the UK. There's much uh, less regulation now. That's a challenge in many ways because, um, as a result, a lot of more waste is being dumped. But actually, we can say, look, there's an opportunity to start collecting material, valorizing it, and let's get out and get on with it. You know, what's going on in Gunja, you know, we would need licenses up to the, um, the eyeballs to do in the UK. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there's not a large amount of open dumping in the UK, so you don't need to be doing that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So is, 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 you, is your hope that you can match water aid over the next 35 years or or is that a little bit you know uh, I, would never, I would never say that you know um all i'd say is there's a lot of garbage out there we have a lot of interest um and people are keen to keep going I and mean, we are totally beneficiary led you know we just have, literally have people coming to us we just have emails every day going hi i'm living in a town we've got too much rubbish what can we do and that's how our conversation starts um we have this uh toolkit which you know um was funded by CIWM um, and um, you know, lead author Zoe again, cracking job getting out that, that out there. I think we've had about 70,000 views and downloads um, so far. Frankly, we've given up following it because it's going up so quickly. But there's just a huge amount of interest and it's, it's of the hour. Um, you know, we are an urban species now. We are living in towns. Um, people are consumers. Um, you know, as I was saying um, when I, um, in the Kit Strange lecture last week that uh, you had to endure from me as well. Sorry about that. I'm having to listen to me going on and on a lot of the moment. Um, you know, the world is going through this industrial re industrial revolution with billions of people moving from agrarian to industrial societies, and with that becomes you know this cash economy where people are purchasing materials. Thank you. Apologies. Uh, clearly, uh, the reception in London is not as good as it should be. Um, but I'm back, Mike. So you're not on your own anymore. Uh, I, I, I apologize for dropping off in the middle of you saying something really profane, but I, I want to come back to something that we were talking about earlier, which is working, you know, you're, you're getting invitations from people all over the world in all sorts of circumstances, interested in how you can help them. How do you ensure that the governance structure that you're walking into is going to be appropriate? Well, I mean, what due diligence are you doing before you turn up in the field? Good, good question. Um, for a start, we have the toolkits. I think, as I said, you know, um, as I can't forgive me if I, I've repeated this. I don't know when everyone just left to me, but obviously funded by CRWM and managed by Zoe. Um, that toolkit allows us to at least give people the tools to 
self-help so we don't have to sit there and have all of these concerns about due diligence and uh, and uh, and governance so people are um aware and i mean i think that's just coming back that's one of the key things this has to be just up a lot uh, up meet people's um agendas um, more generally um the more people worrying and caring and doing things about this sort of stuff the, the quicker we will find solutions you know i certainly don't have all the solutions waste state doesn't have all the solutions you know i'm a great believer in you know many hands make light work and you know you get lots of heads together and we can come up with solutions so let's get it up the agenda so that's a key thing um in terms of due diligence and governance you know we have um you know just from a basic point of view a kind of a um, a set of due diligence procedures. You know, if you're working with an organisation, what is its track record? How is it set up? In what environment um, is it working? Um, there's a whole range of kind of um, fairly, um, I don't know, simple steps that we take to make sure that you know we're working with an organisation that is going to be working transparently. I mean, one of the key reasons we are generally working with community-based partners is because often you know government governance is weak and governments aren't working in the way that you know we might expect in other parts of the world. So we've got to ensure we're not just repeating those same issues with um with you know with our partners. Um, but um as far as um, understanding and working in places you know we um don't work in for instance particularly fra you know very fragile states so um working in places where it's very tricky to sustain and work and deal with issues you know often there's much more immediate humanitarian needs and of course there's that difference between humanitarian aid which is essentially allowing people keeping people body and soul together to keep going during you know a crisis whether it's environmental from drought or flood or you know civil or the development which is a saying to people okay you know uh, you're uh, perhaps living in poverty now what can we do to help you getting out of those get out of those situations but yeah we have due diligence procedures i mean often okay. when we're working with funders obviously they're very interested and keen to ensure that you know, we're working with diffid on three different projects at the moment uh, they are very keen to ensure that their you know funds uk taxpayers funds are well spent so i i, I totally understand i think if you're working through a, a donor agent like diffid or somebody then they will have their own due diligence of course but um what about when you get these you know these interesting emails from you know somebody in in burkino faso um yeah. really really wants to do some great work around plastic bottles in their community what happens then i mean okay, yeah. are you getting in the field or are you making a phone call or are you contacting a donor agent how, how do you make a project happen when it's so early in yeah, its no, gestation um it it takes the reason we have the talk is to say to people right there you go you've got something to go away with immediately okay because in reality you know projects take a long time so for instance um our project in kenya started uh, Janu uh, january february 2016 was the initial assessment visit okay and um it has taken since then to therefore find a funder who's interested in funding it uh write a proposal it took a couple of attempts to get a proposal through and then you know finally kick things off so yeah it takes a long time to get projects going you know that is why talking about waste advocating for it getting the evidence out there that it is important um it is key because that means that more people within their communities can start taking uh steps themselves so you know as a result we have yeah three projects but seventy thousand downloads from the from the toolkit you know that's the difference now not all of those seventy thousand will have resulted in action but you know if you get 10 percent of people actually taking something um five percent of people frankly one percent of people you know actually taking an action then you've got a lot more people moving on also you know you've got people working within a place that they know uh taking the steps doing things in the way that they think is appropriate and also you know obviously when as soon as you cut out international travel and um having to pay people from europe european wages um you're doing things a lot more cost effectively as well that's great. I mean, it's, that's fantastic to hear. You, I mean, I, I'm just going to advocate your toolkit, by the way. Um, you know, A, I was involved in peer reviewing it and it was my pleasure oh, yeah, to do absolutely. so. But, Thank you. Thank you. That's all right. But, um, <laughs> but you know, more importantly, anybody that's on the line, you know, go away and have a look. It's, 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 it's designed to be used in the field. Uh, it's designed to be accessible. It's designed to give you a start. Um, it hasn't got all the answers and it shouldn't have all the answers because it can't be that bespoke to every environment. But it's definitely a great starting point. And, you know, Zoe and yourself, Mike, did a great job. So, so well done. Now, tell me about your volunteers, because I know lots of my ex-staff before I joined mm. Suez and, and many of my friends in the industry are either on your board 
or they're out there doing volunteer work in some some location here or here or there. How how does that all come about? I mean, how many volunteers have you got, and and you know, and, and where are they coming from? Oh, we've got lots of fantastic volunteers. How many? Crikey, we've got a spreadsheet somewhere with all the names on. But we've got <laughs> um, we've got a fantastic board, of course. You know, we're a registered charity. The board is entirely voluntary, and they spend an awful lot of time and an awful lot of brain power. Uh, thinking how we can grow and develop. I mean, they're an extremely important group of people and, you know, really a sort of shout out. It's And they have quite quite thankless tasks, you know. They sit there in the background sort of doing all the boring bits and allowing us to, you know, grow, develop, um, me to be sitting here having a conversation today. Um, we have um, <coughs> volunteers that work in the UK. So we've been attending pop festivals, doing sponsored walks, all of these sorts of things, and it all needs people to help organise. Um, so we have, for instance, uh, Sally Talbot, who organises our walk every year. We had um, uh, Leanne Wood, who kind of she's our volunteer coordinator of volunteers, if that makes sense. Um, so she sits there and gets people together, develops the rotors, all of that sort of thing. But we also have people increasingly, as we're developing our kind of portfolio of projects, <coughs> excuse me, people coming out with us. So we had um, Jen from Keep Britain Tidy coming out in uh, November, who did some fantastic work. I mean, what was really important and useful about her work is that she, um, working for KBT, they know an awful lot about um, street cleaning and litter, and she was using some of the, the skills and the approaches they've developed there, but in a new context. So how can we survey, uh, do litter surveys? How can we do open dumping surveys that are appropriate for um, you know, low-income countries where they don't have comprehensive waste collection. So having that kind of real uh, skilled volunteers. We've also um, we had um, uh, Victoria Manning who came out with us in January. Who came out um, again to the Gambia? She's a, a waste planner. She was beginning to talk at a kind of slightly higher level, seeing how you know we can replicate what we do in other places. She was doing a cracking job again. Um, and we've got a, we've got more volunteers coming out with us. Uh, in Kenya, I'll, I'll be able to announce that soon. Um, but yeah, I mean, we what is different, I guess, between the third sector and perhaps uh, you know the more kind of business-minded um, end of things is that we can leverage a lot of interest and goodwill. And there's if people are interested in getting involved, hey, you know, volunteer, please. You know, info at wasteaid.org. We'd love to hear from you. Um, <laughs> good plug. Good plug. Well done. Yeah. Can I can I say I, I I was on a panel with Jen just the other week and. Um, oh, yeah you've left a lasting impression on her her time in the field has completely opened her eyes to some stuff that maybe she wasn't um you know resonating with previously so you know you're not only doing great work in your countries of choice with the with the local communities but you're having an impact on you know uk waste practitioners as well which can only be good as more and more of us spend time overseas doing our day job or doing our volunteer work so so a big commendation to you and your teammate it's been it's been excellent to watch others grow and and their enthusiasm for what you're doing as a as a day job and as a as a career almost is um yeah it's brilliant so well done um question because i'm conscious of time and, and i'm still waiting for somebody to write a really good question but you know in the meantime i've got one or two more for you um we, you you mentioned the kit strange uh, annual lecture the other week um you know that's an honor bestowed on the uh, the number one head on show the top trump in the um in the resource hot 100 waste and resource managers uh which is voted for by usually by peers in our industry in the uk and that was your your title last year number one top trump um what has that has that meant anything to you this year has it opened some doors has it put more pressure on tell me about your year um because you know you've replaced people like david attenborough and you've beaten you know michael <laughs> gove the, the the secretary of state for the environment so you know you've obviously done something right mate what's um uh, has it put more pressure on um has it put yes i mean I, in a way i mean like generally you know the organization is growing so uh you know there's more to do you know uh, for, for many years we've kind of you know zoe and i have dreamed of being in this uh position where there's a lot more work on but all of a sudden there is so you know hey we're busy um it is uh great to have i guess the recognition of the sector um when you start out and set up an organization um people are looking at you kind of going through who are you and you know what you know why should i you know and, and you want to do this and so you know and we have you know, within the waste and resource sector, I think it's fair to say, you know, we have a few hard bitten characters who are a bit cynical about life sometimes. And, um, you know, so they're a bit like, sorry, you want to do what? Um, but <laughs> what we're just trying to say to waste and resource managers all over the world is what you do is absolutely crucial. 
and in many parts of the world the basics have been sorted to a degree you know i'm looking out the window now at a kind of fair, you know a pretty clean street now the people you know in my village where i'm sat now think that that clean street just happens um it doesn't it's because there are people there at you know probably some um incredibly early hour of the morning sweeping away uh, doing it for not a huge amount of um income it's a hard job they're out in all uh, you know weathers and uh, again you know you're in london london would be simply uninhabitable if there were not you know huge teams of people working for you know your organization and many and and, and others you know keeping that place clean and almost the problem that the waste sector has had is that they've become so good at spiriting this stuff away that people just don't think about it they don't think about the consequences of the amount of waste they produce what waste they produce even how they discard it um you know the fact that what we spend a billion quid a year on street cleaning in the uk i mean crikey you know that's just because people are littering if we weren't littering we'd have a billion pounds to you know spend on something that you know people might actually want more than just having you know their, their rubbish cleaned up after them you know we're so good at it and it's only by its absence that you really notice it so i'm just saying to kind of um, waste managers when they um come out and volunteer with us when they get involved it's just to say look what you do is really important you know we all get ground down by the day-to-day -day job day job but take a step back remember why if you're not there doing what you're doing you know your town city village whatever would be a much grimmer and dirtier and more dangerous place and unfortunately there's lots of people in the world still managing with that that's a very good message now i've got a question come in so let's give deborah her, her, her due here what are the differences in waste composition and approaches to managing it between different countries you've worked in mike and, and I'll, I'll say something from my experiences too but you, you kick off different compositions and different ways of treating it um, so, I mean, with, with waste comp, it's, you know, any information is better than uh, than none at all. Okay, so we always say to people, like, work within your resources. So that may, can mean that essentially you have different, many different approaches. When we have had the resources, we have essentially followed the UNEP ITC um, approach, which is um, actually not always suitable exactly for where we are working, but the point is it's consistent. So as a result, you can compare different countries. Okay, however, that is, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, 40 something different waste streams. Um, that's quite a um, resource intensive and um, you know, strict approach. We would say to people always, you know, even if you don't, if you are working within your community, um, we have a basic approach to um, waste auditing within the toolkit, get on and do that. Even going out and doing a quick, quick and dirty visual audit, right, there's a large pile of um, waste outside, what's in there? You know, just having a look at the things, not treating it just as rubbish, just as garbage. OK, just understanding as soon as you start thinking about and understanding what's inside it, then you can start doing something about it. Um, that's, that's, it's good. That's very, there's that's a very nice one about your reading up from Leanne. Just a big shout out for Leanne. That's our uh, volunteer coordinator. <laughs> Um, on the composition, I'm going to come to Leanne's question in a minute. On the composition front, I, you know, having worked in Eastern Europe, having worked in North Africa, having worked in Latin America, there are definitely, you know, different trends in in material streams. You know, paper yeah. is less prevalent in some places than others. Plastics. I mean, when I first started working in Egypt in the late '90s, there were there was hardly any plastics in the waste stream at all. Yeah. But over time, all of the all of the um, the fizzy drinks were suddenly switching from glass bottles where they had a, re a deposit return scheme in operation to plastic bottles. And suddenly that created a completely different issue for both the formal and the informal collection system. So when I was working on on projects that were more strategic and trying to join some of these programs together, it was just you could see that change happening overnight. And it, I, that's quite a concern, I think, when you're working in an environment that suddenly the consumer patterns and the and the big brands are completely determining what's available or not. So, yeah, I've seen that firsthand. It's really interesting. Question for you, Mike. Um, have you got any experience of working in Colombia? Because I haven't. Uh, no, I was lucky enough to um, visit Ecuador uh, with uh, Terry March, the then CRWM president back in 2010. Um, very interesting place. Um, again, um, there were... Uh, challenges very kind of vibrant um, informal sector and it's what's really important is that as organizations uh, as countries grow develop as more money begins to be spent on waste management these guys are brought into the fold they are the kind of eco heroes the people that are you know collecting material valorizing it 
and it's important that these people are brought in into the fold. I mean, one I remember going to a place called Cuenca, and there's a very interesting approach where essentially waste pickers living on the landfill sites. Um, what they'd said to them is, okay, what materials are you interested in? And they'd said we're interested in whatever it was, plastics, glass, metals, etc., uh, etc. Et they then set up a commingled recycling um, collection using essentially one of their uh, spare refuse trucks um, and set up a simple sorting area. It was a covered area, a bit like a Dutch barn with a roof and no walls. There was a concrete uh, apron, apron for them to work on. There was places to wash your hands and they built some rudimentary accommodation blocks because people have been living in kind of literally lean to on the dump site and said, OK, you know, we're not going to stop you doing this. What we're going to do is just help you do it in a more organised and safe way. And also they helped them organise into a co-op so actually they could start making more money from the materials they were collecting. So really interesting place. I mean, there's been some fantastic stuff going on in Latin America around kind of empowering and working with the informal sector. Um, so um, but no, I haven't worked in uh, Colombia if, if anybody's interested in, in informal recycling in Latin America, check out Sonia Diaz. Um, yeah, yeah. I've, I've worked with Sonia over the years through a number of projects and, and on a research basis. And some of the work she's done on the informal sector from one country to another and it's comparative is is really fantastic. Now, I'm conscious of time and suddenly the question questions are flowing. So a quick one here from Alfred. What strategies and activities uh, can we use to keep community participation in waste management? I'm going to go first, Mike, on this one. So you can have a think. There was a community engagement toolkit designed for sort of solid waste management in, in um, developing economies that was published all back in the early noughties. Um, and it was um, partly USAID, partly um, UN, and it was it was led by by ERM and, and partners um, from across the world. And and interestingly, the lead author on that was a certain Professor David Wilson, who um, recruited me out of academia and, and plonked me into Eastern Europe and told to get on and write a waste strategy. Now, I know David is a is a strong advocate of waste aid as well. So, you know, there's a recurring theme here about people that have committed their lives to to improving the. The, the, the setup and opportunities in in uh, transition economies around the world. So do you want to say a little bit about David and then and a little bit about your toolkit, maybe, Mike? Sure. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, no, David is one of our patrons and uh, he is, you know, uh, a leading light. He is absolutely committed to the improvement of uh, decent solid waste for all and that idea of essentially environmental justice. We all deserve to live in a clean and a healthy environment. Um, as far as strategies and activities, keeping community participation what we would say is talk to people about waste in a way that is relevant to their lives. Now, um, there's lots and lots and lots of good reasons to improve your solid waste management. We've got the environmental ones, the, the, um, the marine plastics and the climate change and the resource security. We've got the economic ones. There's great opportunities to create jobs and make uh, money out of doing this. But also they've got, we've got the, pub, the basic public health ones. And again, sometimes it's easy if you're working and living in a place with this. But, you know, kids that grow up in dirty environments are twice as likely to get diarrhea, six times as likely to get uh, breathing problems. Um, I, I was lucky enough to actually visit uh, Pakistan um, to have a look at a tier fund project at the beginning of um, December and just to talk to people who were living in the community, which had had a solid waste collection starting the previous six weeks. Saying to them, and they were saying, yes, our children don't have coughs now. We're not spending so much money on um, medical bills. Uh, we don't have wild animals roaming um, through our um, communities looking for um, waste. We don't have um, essentially um, heroin addicts um, wandering through our community looking to, to scavenge recyclables anymore and then attacking people at the same time. So, you know, it's just phenomenal the difference that waste makes. And what I would say to is, is understand your community. So if you're working with farmers, say, look, you know, organic waste is a fantastic opportunity to make uh, free, uh, free or very low cost soil conditioner. And di what do you think about people open dumping on your farmland? Talk to fishermen saying, do you know what the impact of marine plastics is happening, happening on um, the fish that you're fishing? Talk to tourism people, people who are interested in tourism saying, do you think tourists are really going to come to a dirty environment? Talk to parents saying, this stuff's making your kids sick. Choose your message and then hammer it home. There's lots of different messages. And again, plug for the toolkit is all in there saying, who am, what are the, who am I talking to and what can I talk about? Just choose the right ones. Now your driver, for instance, someone might be funding you for to reduce marine litter, for instance, if it's a coastal town. Well, great, you can reduce the marine litter, but also make much healthier environments, make 
provide opportunities, economic opportunities for the poorest. You can do all of that and just pick your message depending on whom you're working with. That's what I'd say. That's a, that's a fantastic point to wrap up on actually, Mike. You know, that community insight and using the appropriate language, that's just as applicable in any location, not just a transition developing economy. I'm doing that now at the moment, stakeholder engagement around the siting of new infrastructure. I need to understand those communities and what, what's going to drive them to get involved. So I think that's a really positive way to end. Mike, is there one, one message, one, one, one strap line, one sound bite you'd like to leave us with today? Uh, there's a lot of garbage out there and we've all got to keep going. Uh, we're, you know, Adam, you were saying that, you know, you were doing this a few years ago and there's still, you know, lots of waste. Well, yeah, it's not going to go away. Uh, there's only going to be more waste in the world and it needs to be uh, addressed. So everyone just keep going and onwards and upwards. I'd like to thank Mike for his time today. Uh, he's a busy guy doing some really important work. So it's been really great to, to listen from him doing stuff that's in the field helping communities from the bottom up. That's fantastic. Thank you, Michael. Uh, a big yeah. shout out to Leanne, who's the only one that noticed that I was using a disposable coffee cup today. Uh, you don't want to know why, but my um, my normal reusable coffee cup started to leak this morning when somebody banged into me on a train coming into London. So I am waiting to buy a new one on the way out of this meeting, but I thought better I turned up on time than be uh, late, but have a reusable coffee cup in tow. So well put, spotted, Leanne. I'll give you a bonus point when I see you soon. It's been an absolute pleasure for me. Um, I like to see questions. I like to see people engaged. The Be Waste Wise platform's fantastic. There's more conversations to come. Watch this space and they'll keep you posted. So it's been an absolute pleasure for me. Thank you for your involvement. Thanks. You're on mute. Hey, uh, thank you so much to both Adam and Michael. And I'm sorry that I was on mute and I didn't realize that. So thanks a lot for your time. We're going to have Adam uh, moderating more panels for us this year. And uh, apologies to whoever is watching for all the technical issues that we faced. We'll ensure we edit both parts of the panel well so that you can replay it whenever you want to before we put it up for everyone. So thank you both. We I will catch you both later some other time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>